it's so nice to see you yeah. here. Because, well, I'm doing this mailing so I can catch up with you. I think <laughs> last time I was in your studio was like more than two years ago. It yeah. has been a different world. It so is. it's very nice to see the studio is still as wonderful as it is. And you too. <laughs> yeah. I hope you're well. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think it's very interesting, especially politically talking to you at this moment, because although as everybody thinking you are this genius, avant-garde genius who are so good at technology and the nexus of art and fashion and science, but I know most of your work is actually to portrait, to mimic, or even to discover the natural world. So it's actually particularly poignant to ask you this question right now, like during the whole, during the whole pandemic and during what's going on in the world right now, does that, how does that change or influence your view to nature and to human nature? I'm really curious, I would like to know. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, indeed, my work uh, is super inspired by nature. Like uh, each, each collection in a different form, but uh, ultimately nature is my biggest muse. Um, it's in all her variation and transformation and transformation in general is a big influence in my work and that's because I come from dance. I think there's a beauty in movement, change and transformation in micro scale but also in a macro scale and it feels like um, we are in this, in this big wave of movement and this big wave of change and um, it's even more prominent, therefore, in in my collection, in the upcoming collection that I'll present in January. Um, I, I think there's a growing consciousness, uh, a global consciousness of of our place on this planet, and um, we we have a sense of of being superior, but I think realization it's coming closer and closer that we aren't and that we have to find innovative uh, new ways of collaborating with nature so all the essences in my work uh, the, the focus on transformation the focus on nature and um, the, the focus of collaboration and innovation it feels all so relevant for the time that we're in so it's um, it's in a way it's scary times, but I think there is also new um, new spaces are being opened up to to change our behavior and to change the way we create fashion, the the, the way we we yeah we we collaborate with the world around us. Well, I think I have two questions from this. So one is, yeah, I think the whole lesson is teaching us like human being is not really, it shouldn't be the dominant center of the universe, right? There's yeah. so many much larger forces and beings and even something so tiny and invisible can kind of defeat us all. So yeah. among the whole this new realization, so what is, what is the role of a human creativity? So what can we do? What, what do we still need creativity and art and beauty? I think art and creativity is uh, about telling stories to each other and creating connection. And that connection, I think, is more needed than ever because we are in a period of, of um, solidarity and also in, in, um, in a moment in time where a lot of connection is lost between uh, between people. So it's really important to, to tell new stories of, of creativity and connection, and also to tell a story that focuses on uh, new, um, new ways of collaboration with nature. So also a story of hope, because I think all the problems that we have created in the way we create, are solvable in the end. And I think fashion especially is one of those industries that really have to change. So to me, it feels important that in every um, creative um, project that is being created now, that there is this sense of consciousness and 
uh, a message of change and also a message of hope. Mm -hmm. So, what? Tell us a little bit about your was trans, the the one you show in Paris in January is your 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 latest collection, or you also released a film in July, right? So that's not a new collection. So it's the one who is focused on hydrozoa. Is that your latest collection? So tell us a little bit more about that. And also, uh, I'm also actually found, because I was just reading this, I saw that, and it's actually kind of coincident because I just did my forum last week and then I, I make it online this time, even though in Shanghai, everything is fine. You can do all kinds of exhibitions, fairs, wrong way, but I feel it's more right to do it online because I can connect more people. Yeah. So one of the big thing is about the underwater world. So I have this marine ecology NGO. They showed me this film because I'm actually not really um, an ocean or marine person. I'm a, a little bit afraid of water, mm -hmm. but they show me this whole uh, dark water photography. They photograph all those planktons mm -hmm. and then the whole world within the ocean is like a galaxy itself. So. I was so mesmerizing. Yeah. And then I tried to, then we have a VR artist trying to make it into kind of a little bit of landscape. And cool. then by talking about that and by looking at your work, I feel like, hmm, am I mimicking you? I'll <laughs> 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 be heavily influenced by you. So tell us a little bit about the collection. Like, I don't know why all of a sudden we are using like marine biology and marine, what, hydrozoa as inspiration. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, the, the deep sea is such an unknown world to us. Um, they say that only 5% of the sea is being discovered uh, by us. We know, yeah, we know so little. We probably know more about the universe than we know about our deep seas. And it's a whole universe with creatures that are still unknown to us, but also the connections um, that are... Uh, being made on the water, the, the, the way um, these different species live together. It's, it's all, uh, yeah, uh, a new learning uh, phase to us and also to understand the way we relate to the sea. So at the one hand, we know so little about the deep sea. And on the other hand, we influence it in such big matters that it felt really inspiring to me to uh, to to look at the life that is deep down there and to um, to take it as an inspiration, especially within its movement. Um, we know all the beautiful movement that is being created by like birds or other animals that are all around us. But the, the, the way uh, these creatures move on the water uh, is just extraordinary and it felt so inspiring to to take those different forms of movement as an inspiration for trying to let fabric behave in a different way and to um to to try to create a different sense of gravity i mean gravity obviously has a different meaning uh on the water and i really try to create that 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 sense of a non-gravity within in, within the movement in the, in the collection, and it was super hard to do, but uh, it felt so um, exciting at the same time to 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 yeah to try um, and find out um, a, a real different way of, um, of of movement within the materials that we are working with, and at the same time. I also felt inspired by um, a scientist and artist called Ramon Ikadjal, um, mm -hmm. who was a neuroscientist um, and was discovering the neural signals within our own bodies. And it was really beautiful to, to connect um, our inner systems, our inner sensory systems to the sensory systems that are living within, uh, within the, the sea. So it was um, drawing parallels between different worlds that have uh, that are yeah that are having connections um, that are maybe invisible but um, felt very present to me. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you mentioned that it's quite difficult to portray the movement of the water or non gravity. So can you tell us a little bit more about like so what kind of technique or what kind of material do you use to realize it because 
it seems like you also have this big fascination about water. I think most people start noticing and really truly amazed by your work is about like, was that 10 years ago? You make all this big splash. Was yeah. that through like 3D printing or something? So it's also about how to use like the existing material to portray something which is in movement. So, yeah. so how do you do it this time? Um, it was really a combination of uh, innovative processes combined with traditional craftsmanship, uh, which is an ongoing um, evolution within my work. Um, for example, the finale dress, I think, was one example of a dress that was moving in a completely new way that uh, we didn't manage to make ever before. It was really um, a process of several uh, months to, to get it there. But the dress was made from a really fine uh, fabric that we call glass organza. Um, and it's almost invisible when you look at it, but we were able to uh, screen print it with, um, uh, with the work of an artist that really um, looks like the textures of some uh, underwater creatures. And then we were building very fine frames, again, almost invisible of PEG, which is actually the same material of the water dress that we uh, made like 10 years ago. But then in fine lines um, mm -hmm. of one millimeter only that were laser cut and then um, heat molded to all spread out like a fan but it's all mm. so fragile that you only have to move a little bit with your body to, mm. to sort of um, accelerate the fanning movement that a, that a fish would do on the water. So mm. it's really building upon the knowledge that we have been working on uh, in, yeah, in different garments before and trying to combine uh, it all into this particular one, yeah. Mm. That's great. And all of a sudden, I just have a ridiculous questions because I think a lot of work is like, it's imitating or mimicking or it's kind of portraying like the movement of like a fish underwater or feathers or birds. It's so everything which is so light. So do you ever portray the movement of like some, some mammals or reptile, like elephants or snake <laughs> or oh, actually, <laughs> does those nice. kind of movement ever come to your mind? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, I like movement transformation in all its skills and diversity. I can even be mesmerized by uh, a rock because the movement of the water has shaped the, um, the texture of the rock, for example. That is movement that is maybe happening throughout thousands of years, but it's still movement. So I'm not drawn by only looking at the movement in our sense of time. I'm fascinated by the circles of life in both macro and micro scaling. And um, for example, I made, uh, it's funny that you mentioned it, I made a snake dress oh. uh, for my uh, Caprio collection that is made uh, out of all these sort of very futuristic looking uh, black high shine uh, snakes. It's all mm -hmm. handmade, but um, it was even motorized from the inside. So the snakes were actually breathing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made that look for Björk as well. And it's uh, very Medusa-like. Uh, yeah. But obviously snakes have these beautiful transformations in how they shed their uh, skin. And uh, we, we live um, uh, themselves in a completely different uh, look afterwards and um, that metamorphosis is really beautiful uh, for for me to look at and um, yeah no definitely there is really um, a lot of diversity in the areas of nature that are of influence it goes really from water to indeed snakes to fossils to skeletons to um, to tiny little insects, when you yeah. look at those through the um, macro photography, you discover a whole new world again. So it's really about zooming in 
and um, learning. I think that's one thing that is really um, so logic to me, but maybe not logic to everyone that for me, creating collections and working on fashion is really not only about creating beauty to, to this world, but it's really about learning about this world. And um, it's really my way of exploring where I am and where we want to go to. So it's, it's, it's one big lesson, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for all creative, creative people, this is, yeah, that's how we explore and experiment with the world. Yeah. And then I'm just wondering, particularly now, what seems I'm also interested, have you ever worked with or, or experimenting with micro bill? Because either in terms of materials or a structure senses, or I don't know the way, because. With a what, sorry? Uh, microbial like bacterials uh virals or like it was tiny little yeah yeah we've collaborated uh, or actually did tests with collaborators in the past on growing uh, fabric and uh, uh -huh. we are in the beginning of uh, going into a new collaboration and um, i think it will be an ongoing uh, research project for us in how far we can push those boundaries because I do think I also work with biomaterial. Sorry. Yeah, oh. and um, I think it has a big potential for the future in in how we create our fabrics. But of mm -hmm. course, um, and that is the same with a lot of other researches that we do or experiments. Um, it takes many years before um, the materials are um, usable enough for haute couture, like that they're durable enough, that they're pretty enough, and that they have the, the same um, textual um, move, movability quality uh, to them as a silk. So it's a long evolution. If you look at how long uh, it took to develop the silks that we know today and the refinement that are in them. Um, a lot of the new materials that are being grown are amazing in their concept, but maybe not durable or pretty enough to, mm -hmm. or uh, nicely uh, touchable enough to, to really implement in a garment. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's an ongoing uh, experiment that we're doing. And um, I think it's just a matter of time uh, before mm -hmm. we can really translate um, that new way of making a fabric into the actual collections. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's also what is so um, stimulating about the atelier is that obviously we are creating a collection, but we're always doing a lot of experiments on the site mm -hmm. uh, without a nearby uh, deadline or goal, because if you want to innovate and if you want to experiment, it often takes many years before it's really um, applicable for the, um, the collections on the one way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So speaking of that, does the pandemic or the particular situation why not influence the way you're, you're making your garment or you're doing your business? The, sorry, if the? It's the current situation, the pandemic, and then, or the quarantine, or the non losing contact with, uh, and then the difficult economy situation. Does that influence, or how does that influence or change the way you are making your collections, or how you doing your handling your business? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's changing the way we communicate with people mainly. For example, um, the atelier is really collaborative with all kinds of disciplines from, from scientists to artists to architects. And normally um, these collaborations are pretty physical in the way that we travel to their studios or mm -hmm. uh, institutes and the other way around. They all experiment on materials um, really together. Obviously now it's all about sending <laughs> and Skyping and Zooming. So the, the creative processes are still going on, but it's mm -hmm. uh, less physical. You're less um, together, but it's still going. And it's the same with the clients. Uh, obviously normally 
the clients come here in the atelier and will do the fittings that way. Now, uh, sometimes uh, it's possible to have someone travel uh, to their place from the atelier, or sometimes we even do a fitting on Skype or Zoom. And then the garment is sent both ways and um, it's still possible. It's just, yeah, working in a different way. And um, it's, yeah, it's the biggest influence is really on seeing each other, on, on communication. Um, but all the rest, I think, is pretty similar. And uh, the, only, the, the only chaos factor, of course, is uh, that we're preparing a show. Um, and that is very unpredictable because we don't know where the world be, will be in, in like two or three months in January. So, um, and that counts for a lot of other projects as well. You're sort of doing, uh, you're creating different scenarios at the same time. We'll prepare for a physical show, we'll prepare for an alternative, and then we see what the flow will give us. It's really about going with the flow and trying to be as creative as possible for all the obstacles <laughs> on our way. Yeah. So what does that mean you're trying more in the digital format? Like um, in the presentation or you still think the physical presentation is very important? Or will yeah. you try more things in, in a digital space? Or? I'm preparing for both uh, because mm -hmm. of course the, um, the most preferred setting is the physical show because there's a beauty to really celebrating um, the work um, collaboratively like um, with the clients, with the press and really um, being able to, to see it in, in, in movement up close. But um, if that's not possible, obviously uh, there are different ways of, um, of presenting the collection. So we are really preparing for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then of course it was kind of emerging trend and um, particularly amplified by this year particular situation. So there's more and more people are doing like virtual model, virtual, virtual garment and virtual world. And I even attend a virtual conference like last month. So, I mean, I don't know what's your take on the, all this virtuality about garment or fashion or or object or art makings because things like in one way, like people think you're so advanced at all kinds of technology. Like would this be the type of technology you will look into? I mean, will you do or design like a totally virtual digital garment? Mm, I don't think there's a big challenge in it because virtually everything is possible and that sort of kills the creativity. Um, I think there's a beauty, especially in haute couture, of the craftsmanship that has evolved over the, the thousands of years. And um, I think that knowledge is inside our bodies, if you look at the atelier, and it would be such a shame to, to go the easy way. <laughs> um, I, I'm fascinated by three-dimensionality, and to me, a flat screen will never be as emotionally um, attractive as seeing work in real life uh, because there's a dimensionality missing. So mm -hmm. as long as we can do um, the work physically and mm -hmm. really uh, create the craftsmanship as, um, as we are doing it now, then we will, yeah keep on making the collection phys physically because there is a beauty on pushing those boundaries in the physical world because there's a lot of boundaries to break uh, in there. Um, there's a real evolution waiting there in terms of materials and techniques. There's so much uh, unexplored. It's like the deep sea. I feel in fashion we've only explored 5% of what is actual actually possible and I think uh, a new collaboration with nature and implementing innovation uh, in that will open up whole new worlds and digitally uh, I think th it's a great communication tool but uh, I don't see it as a, um, a creative tool I don't would yeah I, I it would be a different um, 
a different process on creating a digital collection. Uh, the, the possibilities would basically be, yeah, uh, without any boundaries. And I think there's a beauty to the um, to the real world that I don't want to miss out on in my work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, certainly. So we're yeah. talking in a way like I'm quite familiar with your work, but maybe for the audience who are not too familiar with your work, maybe they want to know like which are the collections you among all your collections, which are the collections you like most or is the most important to you or most pivotal or most can you tell us? It's hard to pick one collection or a few because a few. Ultimately, they are really like my children. <laughs> um, they they all have my heart in them. But um, if I would have to give examples, um, I think Capriol is a very uh, nice one um, because it was my first official show in Paris. Um, or official haute couture show and um, it was a very personal one because I took uh, my skydiving experiences uh, as an inspiration and um, it was really translating only one minute of time and I think that's in a beautiful contra uh, contrast to uh, the process because and that's quite rare, but we take six months for creating like uh, 10 or 20 garments. So we are pretty, uh, we are really pushing the boundaries there in terms of, um, of what uh, a collection means and uh, the time that it takes to make it. And uh, that whole collection only presented one minute of skydiving. So um, it also has one of the earliest 3D prints in there, like the skeleton dress, um, and some yeah uh, nice um, collaborations were implemented in that collection. And I really think it shows well sort of the 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 the, um, the layering that I'm having in my work in terms of art and innovation and collaboration and craftsmanship. It really uh, had a good balance in that collection. And at the same time, uh, we also presented archive pieces of previous collections, um, which obviously is not um, like obvious to do uh, at the one way shows, but it really, I think, uh, enhances my perspective towards fashion that it's um, really not about the seasons. Uh, I think we should become much more flexible in in the way we create, like like artists or musicians, that fashion designers really should create more freedom um, to their process and um, yes, have to stick less to to the seasons of um, of the commercial world. So it it was really about creating that space. Um, and show a different perspective towards um, the timelessness and uh, the seasons of of, um, of a system. And um, yeah, another collection. Uh, would maybe be hypnosis. Um, that felt like a very special show for me. Um, because movement has always been such a driving force in my work and that collection we were really able to push um, that perspective because we collaborated with Anthony Howe who is a kinetic artist mm -hmm. uh, who is really a specialist in, um, in organic movement so all of his sculptures are transforming uh, infinitely uh, through wind only so it's really taking um, uh, taking a natural force uh, as a um, as a transformation tool. Uh, so we collaborated on the um, infinity dress um, that has a kinetic mechanism. So we took a traditional um, 
material um, within couture and fashion, one of the oldest ones uh, we have ever uh, dressed ourselves up with, which is the feather. And I think the feather has a beautiful evolution within fashion on um, how it, yeah, how it has decorated us <laughs> and how it has transformed us and what um, um, traditions and what the um, meaning uh, of it was. And that very traditional uh, material was really transformed through the kinetic um, technique in that dress. So I think it's really a beautiful example of how the old meets the new and how even a material that we think uh, is um, discovered to its bone, <laughs> how it can be reinvented even uh, even in yeah the world we live in today. Great. Uh, so, well, I, I like how you describe like the the first collection. You were saying like actually it took six months to actually portray or develop something which has only happened one second. So it seems like you're always setting up your own time, your own boundary, yeah. your own systems. So is it difficult to be like that? Do you feel lonely? <laughs> like, <laughs> especially in the fashion world and then you work in a warehouse in Amsterdam, which is not really any fashion centers or fashion capitals and for all this time. Yeah. And then you do two collections a year so and you set your own times and then your idea so so yeah how does that feel to be different from anyone else and also do you do you find more and more people thinking like you and feeling the same way because there's also the talk about sustainability and then fashion shouldn't be like so fast and then we don't need so many seasons and then yeah so exactly. do you find with more and more people thinking like you do? Yeah, in a way I do. I mean, I, I, for me, it feels very powerful to, to have my own system around me. And I, um, I really believe that's the strength behind my work because if I would fit in, in all the um, constrictions that the system has created, I would not be able to create what I want to create. So I have had to create that space for myself uh, to really portray um, what I find important in fashion. And that really isn't about um, quantity. It's really about quality. And uh, I've believed in that from the very beginning. And obviously, um, it's more and more visible that the system at large needs to reinvent itself and needs to adapt to the world that we live in today. It's, it, it feels so old fashioned if you look at the system that is uh, still the, um, yeah, the, the driving force behind um, the seasons. Um, yeah, even on the commercial side, it doesn't make sense anymore. Like we, we live in a digital age now and in an age where we have a um, environmental problem. So we're gonna have to merge um, these two elements and start to become more um, intellectual in, yeah, in, in, in the decisions we make. It shouldn't just, uh, we shouldn't be stuck in a system just because it was like that for the last um few decades and i think uh for that we are in a very inspiring time as well uh strangely enough but i do think the pandemic is forcing the fashion industry to reinvent itself mm -hmm. and um some people will be quicker than others there is mm -hmm. always <laughs> some uh, some dinosaurs that don't wanna yeah uh go go along with the change but i feel most people i i speak to and it's also very present uh in the conversations within the media is that people are really um fed up with the system on how it was yeah yeah well it's yeah it's totally true i mean we've been talking about sustainability or changing the fashion system 
uh, as trivial as should we have fashion wheel now or to like, yeah, the different business model or whatever. But now it's like the pandemic really forced the reality upon all of us. It kind yeah. of really has to make a change. Exactly. So I think we are running out of time. But before that, I'm curious because I read from an interview, you're trying with 4D printing. What is 4D printing? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's one of the experiments. Where is the fourth dimension comes from? <laughs> um, time, actually. Time and change, which is quite symbolic for our whole conversation. Because interestingly enough, as a creator, as a designer, whether it's, whether it's in art or interior or fashion, we are programmed or trained to create something as a finished product. But um, of course, there's a beautiful fantasy um, to think of a future where design can be a somewhat living <laughs> uh, thing that has a life on its own in the sense of not being finished when the creator is done with it, but maybe changes mm -hmm. shape over time, maybe changes function over time, or mm -hmm. maybe changes color or texture or whatever you can imagine over time to adapt to um, to the wearer in, in, in um, functionality as well. In architecture, there are some interesting um, experiments being done on the 4D printing already, um, thinking of uh, buildings that change over time because the needs uh, are always changing uh, also in terms of weather, for example, and it, it, it's the same for fashion. Um, mm -hmm. You would need a lot less clothes if these clothes could change um, uh, and adapt to how we are changing over time. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where the 4D printing could be a very interesting tool in the future um, because it's basically creating a material that changes over time and the, um, uh, the way it changes is basically programmable and mm -hmm. the, um, influences that accelerate the change are also programmable so maybe you want to create a material that changes shape when mm -hmm. there is moist in the air or when it rains or maybe uh, heat is um, one of the um, accelerators to create a different texture. So, um, I mean, also in the sports where obviously there is um, some examples like this, but mm -hmm. the sky is a limit when you think of 3D, uh, 4D printing, because then it's really, the change is programmed within the material cells itself. And um, it's, quite in early stages still, um, mm -hmm. but we are experimenting with it and maybe in a few years, it's really uh, advanced enough to, um, yeah, to be convincible, yeah. That sounds really fascinating. I mean, I really kind of cannot wait, but I can wait to see it. <laughs> We take time. Okay. My biggest job is patience. <laughs> exactly. That's I probably have, the new I luxury. Have, I have be, ideas enough. This is something we were told this year. Patience is the new luxury. It's like Absolutely. we all need to have. <laughs> very true. We all have to be very patient at this time uh, in our lives, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you so much and so nice to see you, even though we don't really like virtual communication or virtual presentation, but still, I still very I'm very happy to see you. I really and I hope I can see you in real person soon. Absolutely, I hope so too. Okay. Take care, I'd love to see you.